just a, a minute or two for some uh, clarification. Just I know not everybody has been familiar with the evolution of T1D Exchange over the past several years. Uh, I think certainly everyone has been familiar with the organization and its uh, inception and, and what it uh, did for a number of years on the left uh, with the Jabe Center serving as a coordinating center and um, recruiting patients at, at visits to uh, participate in that registry. A few years ago, a decision was, was made to uh, you know, kind of bifurcate uh, the effort so that we could more efficiently recruit patients through an online registry. Uh, it allows us to track uh, patients longitudinally, uh, particularly if they move or switch clinics. Uh, but we, we've been able to uh, get a, a more age representative population in that effort where we're gathering information directly from patients uh, via survey and pretty soon uh, via some device downloads that we're looking at. But more importantly, and kind of as the foundation of today's uh, discussion, the Quality Improvement Collaborative uh, was something that uh, was formed several years ago with a um, a group of centers that really wanted to work with us collaboratively to try and impact change and, and measure and monitor interventions and see how we could really use implementation science to improve the outcomes for people with T1D. So tracking A1C and hospitalizations, severe hypo, EKA, uh, also looking at device usage and really uh, you know, using a data-oriented approach um, you know, to improve those outcomes. And we've been pleased with some of the progress um, that's, that's uh, taken place. This infrastructure also, you know, allows us to think about taking on initiatives that are very relevant uh, and, again, weren't necessarily conceived of uh, at the beginning of the year. So the COVID study is certainly one example of that, um, a telemedicine survey um, and some uh, inquiries into racial disparities are things that also the collaborative um, has utilized its infrastructure to kind of launch some different initiatives around that. So uh, for, you know, from some of the, the initial centers uh, started, uh, we then got, got to about 12 centers by the beginning of this year, uh, but we really experienced some significant growth, more than doubling the number of diabetes centers. And we're ecstatic to have um, you know, such a, a great representation of, of centers from across the country participating who are caring for more than 40,000 uh, patients with type 1 diabetes. And one of the nice things about the collaborative is, you know, we analyze data on all of those patients at each center. Um, so we really get a more representative view uh, via the clinical data that we gather um, on how the patients are faring at those centers and, and how the efforts of the the providers there at those centers are really bearing fruit. Next. So I'm going to introduce that uh, we have three uh, excellent speakers today to walk you through the COVID study uh, findings. Uh, first, our own resident expert, Dr. Osagi Ebikosian. Uh, he's our VP of Quality Improvement and Population Health. And uh, he will give some background overview of the, of the overall COVID-19 surveillance project. Um, as well as some information around adult patients with type 1 who uh, obtained COVID and, um, and ho were hospitalized. Then we have Dr. Todd Alonzo uh, from the Barbara Davis Center, who will be talking about pediatric uh, cases of type 1 and COVID, and also uh, examining some issues around DKA. And then finally, Dr. Mary Pat Gallagher of the Hassenfeld Children's Hospital at NYU Langone. Uh, she will be um, you know, discussing um, the ethnicity and, and uh, racial um, aspects of uh, DKA and some of the things that we observed in the COVID study. Um, so we're excited to, to jump into it. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Asagi. Thank you very much, Dave Ray. Thank you, and, um, and thanks again to all of the sponsors so as Dave shared, this will be the outline for our discussions today, and I'll get right to it. All right, so for, for some of our you know, participants and sponsors that um, were in, you know, didn't, could not join us earlier in June when we did the earlier update, the first update, I'll give a little more background to the project and where we are 
Uh, we structured this to be as simple and um, effective and efficient as possible. So our goal was to we design a, a short questionnaire, a survey of 33 questions. And these are some of the questions, uh, some of the main variables we're collecting, the age, the diabetes duration type, last day once in value, and, the, and, the, and the, you know, all of the things on this list. And the goal was for the clinicians, endocrinologists, um, you know, coordinators, research coordinators working in each of those centers to identify patients with confirmed COVID or patients with suspected COVID-19 cases, and then extract all of this information from their electronic medical records and you know, complete that into the survey tool. And we get that on the back end through a Quartrix survey. So that's sort of a you know, high level overview of the methods and how we, get this, how we got this data that we're presenting today. You know, in addition to the 25 centers that are part of the QI collaborative, we expanded this work nationally and, um, you know, invited as many centers as are interested and willing to be a part to join us. So to date, uh, we have 52 centers actively contributing cases and actively participating. There's a larger pool of centers interested in participating, but might not have a, might, don't, they don't have a case to contribute yet, but they're sort of a part of this broader network and join like a monthly calls and are engaged in other aspects of the work. Well, you know, at least 52 centers are contributing. And um, this map sort of shows you the geographical distribution of all of the centers. You know, we started this in April and um, it's still ongoing and we still, we're still seeing a lot of case submissions happening daily, um, you know, with, with this project. We have now 478 submissions in the registry. And again, we're collecting both confirmed cases and suspected cases. And we've seen just a major shift in having a lot more confirmed cases. Um, and I'll, I'll share the definitions of that as well. So um, a little over 70% of our cases now are confirmed cases, while uh, you know, about a quarter of that are suspected cases. As, as testing becomes more available, and, and the infrastructure for that has grown. We're seeing, we're seeing a lot more um, among patients with confirmed cases. And, and by that, we just mean a patient should have had at least a positive PCR antigen test and the definitions there. While for suspected cases, uh, patients that have COVID-like symptoms, so fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, and you know, could not get tested due to testing difficulties or, or a wide variety of other factors that might affect the patient from getting tested. But having this sort of symptoms, we still sort of want to know um, what the outcome is, the clinical progress, and, and, and those same indicators um, I earlier described as part of the survey too. Overall, we have had more females in, um, in the cohorts, uh, more than half of that. And we've also had a higher proportion of adults in the survey, uh, in, in the registry as well. So, you know, um, about two thirds of all our patients um, entered into the survey to uh, older than 19. We had shared earlier uh, some of the preliminary findings, and uh, this was published in um, July in diabetes, in, uh, diabetes Care. Um, you know, this was a very high level overview and description of some of the findings from the first 64 patients. Um, and that sort of, sort of set the stage for what we're seeing with DKAs and um, you know, a lot of the confirmed cases presenting with, with, you know, with DKA, which wasn't too surprising, but also um, set the stage for what we might expect to see moving forward uh, you know, with the pandemic. And, and this paper has sort of been referenced a lot of times and we'll sort of build on that today as we talk about post this first 64 patients in May, June to where we are now in October with you know, over 300 confirmed cases and what we're learning from the different cohorts. We've also had the opportunity to present some of our findings at the ESPAD just concluded conference. So we were part of the invited plenary that talked about DK in Pete and adolescents, and you hear some of that data as well today. And uh, also presented on some of the suspected cases, what we're seeing with inequities there, and um, also for Pete and adolescents in terms of presentation and outcomes 
And then those were in, um, in the se sessions from the just concluded ISPAD virtual conference. So to date, we've been um, actively working through all the analysis of the data. We've submitted um, four manuscripts and they're in different stages of the review process. I'll talk about the adult paper, adult type one and confirmed, case, and confirmed cases. So the main highlight from that paper and I'm told we do the same for PEDS and um, newly diagnosed, why so may proud to talk about uh, uh, DKs, DKs and racial and ethnic disparities we've seen with that. Those four papers have been submitted to different journals, while the last paper is still in development, looking at the New York experience and what we learned from um, that first wave of what happened in New York and the, the experiences and clinical outcomes from that group. All right, so now moving on to the adult patients that were hospitalized for COVID. Our focus really was to try to understand as much as we can, what were some of the drivers for hospitalizations? What were some of the associations? Um, what, were, what are some of the things that could help us clinically and also help the centers and help the T1D community to be able to really start articulating what are those things that we're making, you know, might, might be driving hospitalization among patients with, with um, type one and confirmed COVID. So we already know that is is a risk factor for COVID mortality and mobility. That's been well documented. Um, we already know that patients are presenting with high rates of hyperglycemia and DKA. We know that um, high A1Cs, increased A1Cs were treated with less outcome. A lot of those studies were from, you know, early, um, um, early in the pandemic, where a few of those studies are from China, looking at some of the outcomes from that, from the cohort when COVID started in, um, in, in, in um, China early this year, January, February, where the few of the studies are European studies too. So they also had like a much earlier wave. Um, you know, there haven't been a large scale US-based T1 the focus study, even with the adult cohorts. So uh, we were hoping to sort of add to that literature, add to that evidence, and really sort of share from our perspective with our patient cohort what we're seeing as relates to this two specific um, you know, shutting group as well. So I'll talk about that in the next few slides. So looking at all patients, this is looking at the outcomes now for hospitalization as, the, as, the, as one of the primary outcome. Um, when we look, we had 113 patients as of time of this submission, 58 of them were hospitalized and uh, the, the other group, the sort of our control group in this case were non-hospitalized patients with COVID as well or in the registry, 55% of the 55 patients out of that group. Um, high level updates from this, um, you know, we had a higher proportion of hospitalized patients in the 50 to 60 age category and also in the 61 and older category. And, um, you know, not surprisingly, a less proportion of that in the 20 to 30 age cohort. Looking at race and ethnicity, we had a higher proportion of hospitalized patients in the minority race and ethnicity. So uh, a high proportion of non-Hispanic Blacks being hospitalized in the same with um, Hispanic. And those were such significant differences in, the, in that group. And um, also insurance followed that same trend where we saw a lot of um, um, patients on public insurance being hospitalized. And, and then finally for A1C, um, seeing a lot of patients in um, the hospitalized group having uh, a higher A1C, so A1C, median A1C of nine, as compared to median A1C of 7.6 in the non hospitalized cohorts. And I apologize for the markers there. I think they got a little mixed up as well. But so 9% nine, 9 for A1C in a hospitalized group and 7.6 in the non hospitalized group. And then by category, by A1C category, more than 9% um, or higher proportion, almost 50% of patients with in that cohort of greater than nine being hospitalized as compared to in the non hospitalized group that's 24% um, in, in that cohort. And then when we looked at device use and duration of diabetes, there wasn't any significant difference 
in both groups between hospitalized and non-hospitalized for duration of diabetes. While for uh, CGMUs and pump use, um, the, the, a lot of the um, non-hospitalized patients were not on CGMs or not on pumps. Um, so a higher proportion, um, so, so low, low percentage of patients hospitalized um, where, where for patients using CGM and using POM, that was a, a low hospitalization rate or proportion in that group as well. And then if a patient had a comorbidity, um, any comorbidity at all, so answering yes to a list of comorbidities in the survey, there was a higher proportion of those patients being hospitalized with hypertension and chronic kidney disease really being the biggest driver of those um, for that group. And we'll share you know, in the next slide, the odds ratio and uh, you know, multivariate log logistic regression that looked at, when we look at just age as a standalone category and independent category and adjusted, um, you know, age, age, was in, age, age was definitely uh, a driver, but not as high of a driver as A1C. So unadjusted for A1Cs, 1.42, or fully adjusted when we adjust for A1C, for gender, for race, for insurance, um, you know, we saw a higher uh, odds ratio for A1Cs as compared to age. And then most surprisingly for us was race as an independent factor and also race when we fully adjust for all of the other variables, like, you know, back again, adjusting for A1C levels, adjusting for gender, adjusting for race, adjusting for insurance as well, still seeing, um, you know, more than three times the odds ratio, you know, um, comparing minority to the non-minority group, in this case, which non-Hispanic white group. Cardiovascular disease was also another, uh, another you know, a, a patient with a cardiovascular condition, hypertension, all the cardiovascular conditions um, also had a higher odds ratio of hospitalization, fully adjusted, um, you know, not so much for CKD, um, you know, that it, it was still within, it wasn't a significant difference we saw for, for CKD. So fully adjusted model, race was a big factor, cardiovascular disease was a big factor, age was A1C, but those weren't as huge of, as much of drivers as, um, as race and cardiovascular disease in that entire cohort for um, looking at fully adjusting all of the odds for hospitalization in this group. And then I'll wrap up with just sharing high level summaries of the mortalities and uh, five deaths, unfortunate um, deaths that are recorded in the, in the survey so far. One of them was a 79 year old Hispanic male um, with A1C of greater than, uh, of, of 9.3. And then we also had a 61-year-old Hispanic male with um, chronic, additional chronic comorbidity, uh, chronic kidney disease, and was also on hemodialysis. His A1C was 8.6, but um, you know, it was on long-term um, hemodialysis and long-term management for chronic kidney disease. We had another unfortunate case of a mortality in a 56-year-old male with uh, A1C of 14%, uh, a 36-year-old and a 34-year-old, and additional notes on, on the 34-year-old and 36-year-old with all the contributing factors that we feel contributed to their mortality and was also documented in the case files for those cases. The overall adverse outcomes for this group uh, for the adult patients, 24% of them presented with DKA. And, um, you know, if you would view the world from a positive angle, 60% of adults with COVID actually had no acute complications, while uh, 40 had some of those that we sort of categorize as adverse acute, um, you know, type 1 outcomes following, following COVID or in association with COVID in, the, uh, in this case as well. So I will pass this on now to Todd, just to say thank you to all of the co-authors that have been working with us on this particular paper and this study. And Todd will speak on what we saw with and what we're seeing now with the pediatric patients. And I'll meet myself. Todd, over to you. Thanks, Asagi. I was just, I saw a, a chat comment uh, from, from somebody in the chat section. And the question was in the adult analysis, was there adjustment for socioeconomic status or public insurance? 
with some uh, difference by race due to economic factors. And I can speak to that because it was similar in adult and peds, if I recall correctly, that we didn't have socioeconomic status. That was not something we were able to collect well from the group, but we do have insurance status, whether public or private. And, and across age groups, we saw that um, there, there was some association with private insurance patients being less ill and the, the publicly insured patients being more ill. And, but of course, more of our public in, publicly insured patients were more likely to be people of color. And I can't remember once we cor corrected for race, if we still saw, um, if, if we still saw any differences. Do you recall, Usagi? I don't have that data in front of me. For the, for the pediatrics, when we corrected for race, um, we didn't see, um, for, for insurance, um, we, you know, we didn't see that difference. But in the adult case, even with correcting for um, insurance and, you know, adjusting for that, there was still that huge, huge difference, irrespective of insurance type as well. Yeah. So it's probably, for insurance. Yeah. yeah, so once we expand and we have more patients, we may see that that difference persist in the PEDS um, statistically significantly. So we'll talk about the PEDS paper. We'll jump on to the next slide. And as Asagi does that, I'd like to say thanks again, just to add my thanks to everybody who's participated, both um, our sponsors, as well as all the investigators and, and team members at all the sites who have um, been able to put some time into this. Um, but some of the background, you know, early on when we started this, you know, we, 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 we wanted to learn first about, you know, what does COVID-19 mean for children? And then to take that question and say, what does that mean for children with type 1 diabetes? And so we know that children are susceptible to COVID-19. Um, they don't seem to get as sick as adults do. I think currently we have about 120 pediatric deaths in the U.S., which, you know, while that's really unfortunate that we have any, um, it's, you know, when you look at the, like, in comparison, I think we compare to influenza every year is a really deadly respiratory illness where we'll have, you know, 30 to 60,000 deaths total and, you know, 100 or more pediatric deaths. So similar number of pediatric deaths with far more adult deaths um, with COVID-19. Um, and then, you know, we do know that just getting sick in general for people with, with type one can put them at risk of having to go to the hospital and certainly diabetic ketoacidosis being the, the major concern. And we know that patients with poor glycemic management at baseline are at risk of getting sick and to the hospital with DKA when they get, um, you know, like a, a respiratory illness with fever and vomiting, it usually sets off DKA. So let's go on to the next one. Um, so, you know, major findings really similar to what we see in the adults, that there is a race ethnicity difference where um, our people of color were much more likely to be hospitalized versus non-hospitalized. And then in this analysis, we took out the, the suspected cases um, who didn't have positive tests. We had a lot of those early on, and we've had fewer as we ramped up testing across the U.S. But you, what you see is the, the untested patients um, who probably didn't get sick enough to get tested early on. Um, we're far more likely to be non-Hispanic white. Um, so I don't know if, you know, if that means that white patients were less likely to get ill or more likely to contact us if they weren't very sick. It could be a mix of a little bit of both. Uh, we do see a difference in insurance where our publicly insured patients were more likely to be hospitalized and the same kind of trend with A1C, you know, difference by just the absolute percent where the hospitalized patients had a higher A1C. And of course you see it, it's higher than the adult analysis are hospitalized um, percent was 11.7, uh, non-hospitalized 8.8, .8, which I believe was higher than the average between the two and the adults. I think the average was like 8 point something, 8.6, if I recall right. Um, and then by group, where it looks like hospitalization is, um, I don't want to say exclusively, but almost exclusively in patients with a last A1C above 9%. Um, and that is about 30 to 50% of our pediatric patients nationwide who fit in that greater than 9%. Um, and then so a lot of us considering greater than 9% is kind of our, our line in the sand for high risk. So let's jump, and, and that's high risk in general. Let's jump to the next slide here. Uh, we do see a difference in um, hospitaliz uh, of hospitalization with pump and CGM use. For this analysis, we took out the new onsets to look at them specifically because a new onset patient, of course, wouldn't be expected to have been exposed to a pump or CGM yet. Um, but I think this lines up with what we see with insurance and race, where people of color are less likely to use um, technology, where our publicly insured patients are less likely to use technology, especially with CGM coverage. Um, some of our states don't even have CGM policies for, uh, for Medicaid, and we know some of our colleagues really struggle to get the publicly insured patients um, on CGM. So there was, a, there was a difference in hospitalization here. 
And then down at the bottom, we don't have the red box here. You can see that hospitalizations were really driven by DKA, um, which you know on the whole was really reassuring for us that we didn't see a lot of uh, respiratory illness. Of course, we don't have a denominator to compare that to. Um, we didn't have anybody that was, oh, thanks for, I forgot we had those animated. Thank you, Asagi. Um, you know, but we had, we did have a few patients need respiratory support. Uh, we didn't have anybody who was intubated. A few patients needed nasal cannula and, and face mask. Um, and of course, vomiting was more, more likely among hospitalized patients because that goes with, with diabetic ketoacidosis and of course, high blood sugar and nausea. Uh, we didn't have any uh, deaths among um, patients with confirmed COVID-19, but we did have one 19-year-old um, we, who we included initially in the pediatric data, but she did not have a positive test. She was unable to get tested. It was really early in, in April, and I know Mary Pat knows more for details, but um, probably had COVID, um, and she died out of hospital uh, from probably, a, we think it was a pulmonary embolus, um, and so probably in the setting of, of hyperglycemia and, and diabetes was not well managed at baseline for her, so it was a really unfortunate outcome. Let's jump to the next slide here. And so we did a similar um, analysis. Let's see. Uh, so this was, I have to remind myself which ones this is. So this is patients with confirmed um, with, uh, the, with, with, with negative, and this is right at diagnosis of T1D. So new onset patients. Um, and then that red box is kind of in the way at the bottom. But what I would point out is, um, that DKA occurred in about 62 to 67% between the two groups, which is really, really high for DKA rates at onset of T1D. So with or without COVID, DKA at onset was really high in our cohort. Um, we have looked at our numbers of just all new onsets in Colorado, and our numbers are very similar to this. Um, and internationally, we've seen spikes. There's been about four or five papers from uh, Italy, UK, Germany, and Australia that have been published, and we see a, a real high rate of DK at onset. And we think that's not just related to people having COVID, but the stay-at-home orders and people delaying their care. So it's really um, scary for us when we think about just access, you know, for, for healthcare access in general. Um, so let's jump to the next slide. Um, and so this was the, this was the uh, uh, regression analysis. Uh, A1C was definitely associated, even in the adjusted analysis, with analysis with risk of hospitalization. So, you know, when I kind of take a step back and, and ask, like, you know, what can I tell my patients? And this is the, the real power of this, because I think we've had a total of maybe 20, 25 positive tests across our clinic. Some of those are tests that come in, but I don't know the details of the patient stories. And we have families asking us, what does this mean for my family? Can I send my kid to school? I can't tell you how many families have reached out and asked me that question. And so what I'm able to do is take this data and say, you know, if your child has A1C at or near goal, I'm not very concerned more than, more than I would be concerned for kids without diabetes. But for my patients who have poorly managed diabetes, I do have a higher level of concern. And that leads to us talking about, maybe we should get your child on a CGM. What else can we do to tighten up your diabetes management? Uh, we didn't see any um, differences persistent across the other covariates here when we adjusted for, for A1C. So let's jump on um, to the last one here. And then is, is this my last slide or second to last slide, Asagi? I just want to be mindful of time here. Um, and then age relationship, somebody asked here, I see Brian just ask about, you know, was the age relationship in pediatrics linear? We, we, we looked at age across several groups, you know, just looking at age groups of patients like our, our uh, young school age children, uh, pre-pubertal uh, children and pubertal children. We didn't see any difference in, um, in hospitalization risk or, or severity of illness. And so it looks like at least with the, the end that we have and the power we have, we don't see a difference across the age span. Uh, for severity of illness. So I think what we take away from here and, and what, you know, a lot of us, you know, have, have just kind of realized as we've looked at this data from a lot of different angles is DKA is, is the big risk for people with, with at least for kids and um, for children, adolescents with diabetes. This is the big risk with COVID. Um, it's usually a late finding. So it's a delay in diagnosis. Um, this is why patients with high A1C um, we think that they're at higher risk because they don't troubleshoot diabetes very well at baseline. Um, so we, we talked about, you know, just for all new onset patients, we're concerned about what this means in the U.S., um, but it also may, maybe we have an accelerated phenotype in the setting of COVID-19. So maybe there's somebody who's, who's evolving with dysglycemia, and we're not really sure if we're going to see increased rates of type 1D, uh, T1D presentation 
or if this more severe presentation is going to be following uh, COVID. So I think we're going to we're going to be watching these data as we go on into the future. So, you know, the big message, increased risk for hospitalization, especially with A1C. Um, and then similar to what Osagi had mentioned in the adult patient in the adult paper and what we'll see in the um, inequities papers that minority race and ethnicity really seem uh, to increase risk for hospitalization, probably because these groups um, have poor uh, glycemic management at baseline, they have more barriers to care, and we know that um, communities of color have been hit harder uh, by COVID-19, and there's you know, a lot of data outside of diabetes that shows that. And then next one here. So this is just my last slide, just to acknowledge that we have, you know, just a really big group of people who've been involved in, in writing this and collecting this data. So we're really thankful for everybody who's who's been a part of this project and helped us generate this knowledge. Like Dave said, that we didn't expect to be doing in 2020, um, but we're really glad we've gotten to the point where we have some um, some things, some take home messages. So I'm going to mute myself and let us move on. Okay, thank you. Um, so. I am going to be talking a little bit about the data that we were able to analyze looking at the role of race and outcomes in this cohort. Um, next slide, please, Osagi. So as we've reported previously, we know that racial disparities exist in type 1 diabetes outcomes in the US, and the type 1 diabetes exchange has reported on that as well with higher rates of diabetes complications in minority populations. And we know we have higher rates of DK in patients with type 1 who identify as a minority, as well as people who have lower family income and utilize public health insurance. So as Todd mentioned, uh, we did not have the ability to look at lower family income, but we did look at the other two factors. And the reason we were interested, as Todd alluded to, at looking at race is that we know that the um, people of color were disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and had worse outcomes. And so we wanted to look at the cross section where those two things intersected and, and see what was happening for our families um, who were uh, identifying as minority and who were affected by COVID-19. Okay, next slide, please. So this is some data that we put together for the ISPAD presentation, thus the um, age range being under 24 years of age, which they consider adolescent. And you can see here that um, if we break down confirmed COVID-19 cases into three different uh, ethnic categories, racial ethnic categories, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, and Hispanic, that there is a definite uh, difference in terms of the A1C, which has uh, been reported previously. So we see that it's very significantly higher in the non-Hispanic black cohort. Um, and then also significantly higher statistically in the Hispanic cohort than the non-Hispanic white cohort. CGM use and insulin pump use were much less common in our uh, non-Hispanic black and Hispanic patients. And uh, public insurance was much more common in those populations. Next slide, please. Um, so when we look at the level of care that people got, Todd mentioned a little bit in his uh, presentation, um, people who were uh, hospitalized, uh, the most common um, presentation was DK. And you can see there's a very significant uh, disproportionate rate of hospitalization in our non-Hispanic Black cohort, 68% of people who were COVID positive and who identified as non-Hispanic Black were hospitalized as compared to 40% of our patients who had confirmed COVID and identified as Hispanic, compared both of those to 19% for the non-Hispanic white group. And DK on presentation is even more significant with 61% of people who identify as non-Hispanic Black having DKA, 24% of the Hispanic group and only 7% of the non-Hispanic white population. So very different. Next slide, please. So if we actually adjust um, for hemoglobin A1C, age, gender, and insurance, fully adjusted in the last column, you can still see that non-Hispanic non black uh, patients were 3.7 times as likely um, to present with DKA. So the odds ratio was 3.7, which was statistically significant. And the Hispanic cohort versus non-Hispanic white 
almost twice as likely, even though it didn't meet statistical significance, I think is still meaningful. Next slide, please. So we know now from the different presentations today that we have the increased risk of DKA in our type one patients who have COVID-19. We see that there are inequities in um, diabetes outcomes with COVID-19 and increased DKA presentation. So um, we see that in both children and adults, uh, minority race and ethnicity was associated with increased risk for DKA hospitalization. Next slide, please. So we were able with this study to really um, provide the literature with a little more information about the clinical outcomes of pediatric and adolescent patients with um, COVID-19 and the effect of race on the outcomes. Uh, we think that minority patients with type 1 diabetes appear particularly vulnerable to hospitalization due to DKA, even controlling for hemoglobin A1C levels. And they were much less likely to use diabetes technology. Uh, CGM in particular um, was uh, seen as a risk factor for hospitalization. So we feel it would be reasonable during this time uh, to really try to increase the use of CGM in our at-risk patients and focus on quality improvement projects that can allow us to have more frequent communication. Based on some data that was not shown today, we see that we see very little communication from our non-Hispanic Black and Hispanic patients um, for sick day management. We'd like to focus on that. These are the um, authors I'd like to thank um, for this manuscript, and it's in uh, review for JCENM. Next slide. So the next steps. So these manuscripts that we presented are in review. We're continuing data collection as the COVID-19 epidemic is continuing. We're continuing to host the clinical monthly webinars for all interested parties and routinely updating the study findings. We're now going to expand uh, the project based on some of our observations and what Todd mentioned about the increased um, prevalence of DKA amongst our new onset patients. We're going to try to estimate um, if there have been differences in new onset patients as well as DKA at new onset and DKA in patients who have been previously diagnosed. And then the last step is to participate in some international data comparisons, which should be very interesting. Next slide, please. So estimating, um, just mentioned the new DK new onset project. Um, I, think, I think I said these things. Um, so we, we know that while we have preliminary reports uh, that Todd alluded to, taking a look and saying, yeah, we have more DKA than we normally do. It's not, um, there's still a large uh, data knowledge gap that can be uh, filled. And I think this is a perfect consortium to be able to, to collect that data. Next slide, please. So the aims of this study, which are already, the study is already underway. The first aim is to examine the incidence of newly diagnosed type one during the COVID pandemic period, which is a little imprecise because it changes around the country. But what we're doing for this particular study is January 1st, 2020 to December 31st, 2020, and we'll compare the um, newly diagnosed cases from each of the participating centers from January 1st, 2019 to December 31st, 2019 to see if there's any relevant differences. And then the second aim is to look at that same period of comparison, but this time looking at the incidence of DKA in our type one populations. Next slide, please. So it's a retrospective survey uh, reported from all participating clinics that are participating in a surveillance project. And we're going to have people submit de-identified data as we always do in aggregate for, uh, from the EHR or flow sheets into you know, Smartsheet or some other secure platform. And we're going to collect information um, on all de-identified patients from participating clinical centers in addition with newly diagnosed or existing type one diabetes within the study period, in addition to asking all of the participating surveillance project uh, people to tell us about their DKA. So we are in the process right now of securing all the necessary local IRB approvals. 
and we will be accepting data submission for the study into March of 2021 and hope then to have some data analysis and manuscript development uh, and also some work with the international um, colleagues compar comparing our outcomes. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. I think now we're going to just take some questions, right? Osaki? Yes, and uh, I think Dave will be moderating those for us from the chat box as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Mary Pratt. Thank you, Todd. Okay, so I know we, we asked the, um, I think you answered the question already about the age relationship in pediatrics, whether or not it's linear. Uh, yeah, we talked about that. We, yeah. we didn't see a difference across the pediatric age span. And there were a couple other questions here um, between using and not using technology. I typed an answer about that, that, you know, we, we weren't able to differentiate between either not using technology or didn't have access. Um, that I think that's a, it's definitely a priority for us in the QI collaborative to understand access to technology. And I think we're going to dig deeper there and it'll be across everyone and not just COVID patients. I think that's the right place to ask that question. Right. Yeah. So if, if people have any, any questions from what they've, they've seen, uh, you can type it here in the chat or in the, uh, yeah, stick, stick to chat. There's nothing in the Q and a, um, currently. But in the meantime, I certainly want to want to thank uh, you know, Mary Pat and Todd uh, and all the all the participating centers for for the analysis, the ongoing work, um, and this question that I've heard in a number of different forums. Uh, ATTD has a forum where they've been asking about this question on DKA and what do we really understand what's good new diagnosis and DKA? Can we try to unravel this this question? And I think it's great that we're able to leverage what's been done to date to try and really answer that question because it's not something that I don't think anyone has to, to date um, definitively. Yeah, we've, we've done some work in Colorado to try to look at this question. Um, there's, there's not really recent national data within the last 10 years. I think there may be at least one paper that's in submission um, from search right now, but um, at least in Colorado, we've seen a really big increase in DKA at the onset or at diagnosis of T1D. Um, and this, this trend really stretches back about 20 years, and we were really surprised mm -hmm. to see it in the first decade of this century to increase. And then as the Affordable Care Act came out and we had the uh, individual mandate and more of our patients were covered with insurance, we thought that we would see some improvement. And while the patients who were publicly insured have really stayed steady, it's the privately insured patients that have continued to have a really steep rise. And at least in, in Colorado, we capture pretty much the whole state of Colorado um, so it's, you know, a pretty good look of kind of what's going on in our region. We've seen that there, the publicly insured patients have the same rate of DKA in the most recent couple of years, you know, two, three, four years as the, pri the, private, um, the public and privately insured patients have the same rate. So they've really converged. And what we're, we're really concerned that it's, it's increasing deductibles and disincentive to seeking care and timely care and being more disconnected from primary care. Um, we also did a survey where we asked families, you know, what's going on and, and why do you think this happened? And um, in, in both those kids who presented with TK and those who didn't, um, we found that about a quarter of those people had presented for care and did not receive a diagnosis of diabetes the first time they presented with diabetes symptoms, you know, symptoms that were ultimately attributed to diabetes when they got the diagnosis. So it's a, it's a delay in care, and we also have a system that's not very good at diagnosing diabetes because we know the symptoms are pretty vague early on. Um, you know, and, and we've been trying to ask the question, how do we empower our primary care providers? How do we use electronic medical records intelligently to alert people, you know, this child has lost some weight. Uh, maybe you should consider, consider getting your analysis. So I think, I think the, the solutions are going to really be multifold and really complex. Yeah. And Mary Pat, I'm just curious on, on that topic in the adult um, yeah. you know, sector, you know, this misdiagnosis at times of type two versus type one. And uh, you know, we certainly, we hear from patients directly in different forums and we'll hear about patients getting metformin and sent on their way home when they were in DKA. At yes. The hospital, which it seems very <laughs> right. strange that that's taking place, but I just wonder if, if that's something that this future work can try to um, you know, uncover uh, you know, those types of situations where it's, you know, there's DKA yeah. either at yeah. 
that first visit or because they weren't getting the initial treatment at the first visit, do they then come back with DKA? Right, you know, I think in the pediatric and adult populations, that's an interesting question. And I'll just mention now, Todd had mentioned that uh, we had a young woman who was 19 um, in our adolescent population. Um, she had come to the hospital twice and been discharged um, and diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism and sent home on anticoagulants, but worsened. And because she had been sent home from an outside hospital and that second respiratory illness, she, she wouldn't come back, even though she was getting sicker and sicker. And so, you know, I think in New York, we are very fortunate that all of our pediatric patients have CGM coverage, insulin pump coverage, and it's still not enough. It's still not sufficient to be able to um, close that gap for people um, and in terms of their outcomes. So it's a more complex problem. Um, and so I do think that misdiagnosis um, in older patients is definitely something that I think we that we look will be planning to look at in the future and DKA for sure. And what's very fascinating to me is that if you talk to the adult endocrinologist, they'll tell you that they're more concerned about the hypoglycemic events than the DKA events. But 24% of the hospitalized adults had DKA. That's very high. So it, it's a very interesting uh, thing. And the idea um, of why is, is the question. And um, we know that even in people without diabetes who have been um, hospitalized, hyperglycemia is uh, noted and also bad prognostic sign, possibly a marker of the really severe inflammatory state and possibly a marker of beta cell dysfunction, um, probably both, so. One follow-on question that came up uh, from Molly Malloy, uh, is there any type of educational outreach or initiatives to the ER and the PCPs on kind of testing glucose with all the patients that uh, you know, kind of present with, with these symptoms in a, that kind of emergent fashion? Yeah, so I, I answered that. I was just typing as, as oh, Mary Pat was finishing. Um, but, but to give a little more detail, you may be familiar with the Parma Italy uh, DK reduction campaign. And so Parma is a, a pretty small community um, and they printed a couple of posters. I think it was two posters per school and sent the med students out to all the schools. And it was a two or three year campaign. And the rate of DKA among newly diagnosed patients with T1D decreased. And then when their funding ran out and they let, the, let their foot off the gas, the rate went right back up. So I think we, we know from the quality world that education, while it feels like a really good tool, let's just teach people everything. Um, it's a really hard tool to use because the effect goes away. And we find this just like on inpatient units um, when we try to educate people about, you know, using pumps, you know, what happens is like we teach a bunch of nurses and then they don't touch that pump for six months and then they don't know how to use it or they rotate off and a new nurse comes into that spot. And so what's, what's better is to have systems that are in place so that the right thing is the easy thing. Um, and so we've talked about, you know, putting some alerts in our EMR. I think like a change in BMI Z score would be a really smart thing to put in, especially as things like um, height and weight is portable between different medical record systems and different hospitals. Um, a couple of years ago, we did write a how to, di how, how to diagnose diabetes one pager meant for the primary care provider. And we put that as our cover letter on every single visit note we send out. So now we've sent out Gosh, we do 12,000 visits a year. We've been doing it for two and a half years. We've sent this out 30,000 times in Colorado and in our surrounding states the last couple of years. So when they're, if, if the PCPs are actually reading the notes after our visits, the ones who have patients you know, that come see us at least are getting a really nice one pager. Like, what do you do if you think somebody has type two diabetes? What do you do if they think, if you think they maybe have type one? What if you have a family history, but no symptoms? What if you think somebody's pre-diabetic, like, you know, the, the pre-type 2 at risk, what do I do for those people? So we, we put all that information in one sheet. I don't know if it helps, but it was absolutely free for us to do. Right. Um, so I, for us, it was a no-brainer. Hopefully it's not annoying yeah. people, uh, but it's, I think it's going to be really, really hard. And, you know, yeah. as we just see how complex our systems are, we really need systems that are smarter than the individual users that really drive us, you know, not to make our lives harder as, as providers, like in the ER, but just to make things easier for us. I think that's the only way we're going to get to a good solution. Todd, do you know in the hospital, 
one of the things that occurred to me when I looked at the data and what my experience has been for people cared for in the emergency room is that our type one adult patients are often not recognized as type one and their insulin is not continued. So how many yes. people came in in DKA versus how many people came in with COVID and went into DKA, right? That'll, I mean, we can't answer that from the information we have yet, but maybe we can answer that with the um, de-identified data from our centers, you know, if we could get a little closer and if we could create something in the EHR that could help prevent that for those people, because as of right now, we just tell people you have to be your own advocate. You have to insist, yeah. which is yeah. I think that's that's probably the lived experience of any adult with type one, where um, they probably have to contain their own personal eye rolls anytime somebody wants to educate them about diabetes because they're like, no, right. it's very different from type two. Um, and, and I I've had a number of um, kids that I've seen in clinic whose parents tell me that they have type two diabetes, and I look at them and say, hmm. gosh, you're fit and white and 35 years old really? Yep. Let's test your antibodies. And I, I've yep. actually diagnosed a couple of, of those people and correctly diagnosed them and gotten yep. them onto insulin and, and yeah. hopefully save them a hospital visit. Um, yep. So I th again, I think, you know, smart EMR systems, if you get the diagnosis right on the problem list, then a box, a big red box ought to pop up and say, for the love of God, don't stop the insulin. You know, I think we need things like that. We need smart systems um, because, you know, as a, right, as a specialist, like I have the luxury of like, thinking about diabetes and nothing else most right. of the time. Um, but I, I really you know, feel for our, our primary care frontline providers who really have to think that any patient I'm seeing could have anything and everything. And, and managing that as complex as care is, is just really, really hard. And so you know, not to denigrate them or speak down you know, to those colleagues. I think that what they're doing in primary care and in the ER is just so difficult. And we need systems, systems that are there to support them. Well, great. Um, I think that's it for the question. So again, I just want to you know, reiterate uh, the gratitude to not just our panelists, but certainly to our, uh, our sponsors um, in industry and in research. And um, you know, we're all trying to work together here to answer knowledge gaps, uh, produce evidence, uh, and hopefully you know, improve care on the front lines. And you know, this work certainly has been a, an important part to do that. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the next phase here and, and uh, continue the work. So thank you, Mary Pat and Todd and uh, Osagi. And uh, with that, I guess we'll uh, end the, the webinar. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.